Welcome everyone to my podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. I invite you to take a journey with me into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties us directly to the natural world around us. My intention is to be your guide for this half hour as we begin seeing our world with fresh eyes, gaining more understanding and learning how we can connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us. I feature a broad range of guests deeply concerned about the environmental issues of our time and more. They're authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth and for all species help us create sustainable bridges of understanding. These folks are innovators. They're action-oriented, creating solutions in a variety of ways that honor us and the planet's holistic nature. I am so honored to share their stories, their projects, and their passion with all of you. So thank you once again for joining me for another engaging interview. And today, it is my deep, deep pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolen. She is a psychiatrist, a Jungian analyst, and an internationally known author and speaker. She is the author of 13 books in over 100 editions. She is an NGO permanent representative to the United States Commission on the Status of Women from the World's Summit Foundation in Geneva, which also represents Pathways to Peace. She's a member of the Million Circle, Earth Child Institute Women's Perspective and the International Public Policy Institute. She is a three acclaimed doc she is in, I'm sorry, three acclaimed documentaries, the Academy Award winning anti nuclear proliferation film Women for America for the World, the Canadian film Boards Goddess Remembered and Femme Women Healing the World. So welcome, uh, Dr. Bolin. It's a pleasure to have you here today. You have so much to share with us. Thank you. I really appreciated the invitation because I haven't been speaking about the connection that I have had with nature and trees because I've been an activist on women's circles and mostly been talking recently about how women's circles could change the world. But now I'm realizing how they are linked, that women and trees together have the potential of saving the planet now that we're in shutdown, shelter in place because of the corona pandemic. That's so true. And uh, I read your book uh, last year, and I was deeply moved by it. The connection that you made... Uh, for women and the deforestation of our planet. So what I'd love you to do is to share with us how you began your book and what prompted you to write this book, uh, which uh, might be a little different from some of your other work. It really is different from my other work because I'm, I'm really well known for books like Goddesses in Every Woman and Goddesses in Older Women and you know, Gods in Every Man, the archetypal Jungian side of my writing is known and then I moved into my activism through the United Nations and circle work so somewhere in between those two major interests of mine and expressions of mine in writing came like a tree and like a tree is different from them and I revisited it thanks to your invitation to talk about it which I appreciate very much because I hadn't really looked at Like a Tree for some years now. And I realized, one, it's timeless, and two, there, there's something about this pandemic and the whole sense that it's up to women and trees and the sheltering in place, which finally clears this, the air of all the pollution. And to see the Earth from outer space now with the pollution over the major cities going away and suddenly Gaia, the planet that we live on, our mother, the Earth, is looking healthier from outer space or from not way outer space, but from where you look down upon Earth and you saw the big cities and the pollution over them. So this is a marvelous time to 
for people to connect with nature around them because we are maintaining our distance from each other and can go out and walk. And where I live, there are lots of trees. And so to be where the trees are and to be in a semi-meditative state, which people who love nature get into when we go out in nature. We know we, we connect with the world around us in a different way than when we walk through the city. And I, this book came about because I live in a homeowners association and the issue of trees and paths and things like that come up as a collective uh, uh, agenda item. And I had a beautiful tree, um, a Monterey pine in front of my house, which I saw before I actually walked into my house and realized that I would live here. And maybe I actually had the thought, I might live here for the rest of my life. But it was a tree that, that br drew me in through the, it's on the side of a hill. So there's the tree and there's a, there's a path and then the path deck to the house. And so when the tree went, because it was on a homeowner property, um, the way things work, you own your own house and the land underneath it, but there's collective property around that is wonderful because it, it is maintained and quite beautiful. But what happened is that the tree got in the way of a, no a neighbor's side view and she worked on getting the homeowners association to vote its being chopped down in part also because it was a pine tree and pine trees are inflammable. Um, so I fought it for a while, uh, for, for a year, and I have my own activism, but, you know, I lost the vote. And I realized that, well, maybe I, I could take it one step further, but, you know, like tie myself to the tree and make a spectacle. Mm -hmm. But I, that was, that's not me. I'm actually a rather introverted uh, activist uh, in my way. But I was going off to to New York, to the UN, and to see my friend uh, Gloria Steinem. And I knew that when I was while I was away, the tree would be cut down. So I talked to Gloria about this. Very, it was very painful to lose a favorite tree. is is like losing a friend if you are a tree person. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, so I was telling Gloria about the saga and how I'd lost. And she said to me, remember, Jean, you are a writer. You can have the last word. Hmm. And so I came home with that in mind. And of course, it, initially, I, I was in, in this activist mode. But what I got into was quite different. And the book that results like a tree how trees women and tree people can save the planet which is so timely now in this pandemic anyway i i came back and learned about trees and the more i learned about trees because i, I was pre-med and pre-med you don't take botany you take all the you know the physiology and the body stuff and whatever so i had never taken a botany course and as i was learning about my tree and that for example it was a conifer and that there are only two kinds of trees in the world they're either conifers which are like the pine trees and all the green trees that don't bloom and don't have flowers and then they, there's the other classification the angiosperm trees that that are all the rest of them and so i was learning and appreciating the lineage of trees and what i was also doing was moving into my own recollection from the time I was a Girl Scout and slept out under the trees. So I reconnected with myself as I learned about trees and felt about them and walked among the trees right over the hill from where I live, which is in Muir Woods. So I would walk among the trees in Muir Woods, ancient for California, ancient redwood trees, and feel very much like I was walking in a cathedral. In fact, there there is a grove that that I would walk in called Cathedral Grove within Muir Woods. And to walk in a cathedral of redwood trees is 
very much like walking in Chartres Cathedral or one of the major cathedrals. There's something about the presence of ancient trees and the beauty of them and the soulfulness of them that I would feel when I walked in your woods. Well, the book came about, and um, it was launched in Muir Woods, right outside uh, of the little building in Muir Woods. That was my, the first book signing was there. So it is related to all that moved me in Muir Woods. And then what I had been doing up to that point is I would walk by the stump. The redwood tree was was a very large, I mean, the, the, I'm sorry, the the pine tree, the Monterey pine tree in front of my house was a very large tree, and the stump was very large. And I would walk out my front door and walk over the deck walkway and look down and see this big stump. And it would, initially it made me angry. It would make me sad. I had a feeling about it. There it was, this, this stump, this wounded stump. But after I went to launch the book at Mirror Woods, I had a staff person at Muir Woods with a truck bring back to put on the stump a sculpture made out of an old redwood of a bear cub, a good size bear cub, like about three to four feet tall. Mm -hmm. And it was, it fit, it left room around its bottom to sit on the stump. Mm -hmm. Since then, when I walk by that stump, it's not a stump anymore. It holds up this symbolic bear cub that stands for so much. Mm, she does. She sure does. <clears throat> that's, a, that's an interesting story because... You are an activist, and you did take some action to try to preserve it, but in the scheme of things, it had to come down. So now you've transformed that into something else, and don't you have other plantings that have come up around it and uh, kind of have filled in that area? Because nature does that. It fills it in, uh, the space. Well, actually, in the stump and the bear, I make an effort to, to have it sitting there looking and being quite a presence, and around it are rhododendrons and camellias and a lot of ground stuff. And so it's, it, it, sits, it sits very happily there, my little my statue of a bear, and it, 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 um, it reminds me, as coming home to my own house among the trees, about how fortunate I am to live where the trees still are. Mm. You know, this is one of the things I, I was thinking about how someone described what happens to children in the cities that they have nature deficit disorder, which mm. I had. I, I don't think that's an official name, but it's true. If you are a child who doesn't grow up around nature, you do have a deficit disorder. And because I was a child who lived among, in, in a number of places, but, but I was, I always had a sort of affinity for trees that I did not appreciate until I was much older. Mm. I agree with you there. And I grew up in a suburban area where there was a, we called it a forest, but it was really just a small, parcel of land that had trees on it but we were out there all the time and so your book brought me back to those memories what I loved about what you said earlier though is when you walked among those redwoods you connected with the soul of things and the soul is drawn to what is soulful so I think the questions we're asking along this line is where is soul in our world today with climate change, the COVID virus, with us, you know, being um, brought up against the folly of our ways if we choose to look at it. So your book, Like a Tree, goes through the... Uh, understanding of what the tree family is all about and some of the gifts that they give us and they give us tremendous gifts 
and those voices like yours are raising our awareness to those gifts in the environment that they provide for us and we have just wantonly chopped them down like the trees in in California the remnants of the great redwood forest they represent 3% of what used to be here and the Amazon forests are being cut down. And all over the world, trees are just viewed as property to be logged. And as as trees are cut down, one of the... I mean, what's fascinating is the trees are cut down at the same time that women are are not giving the, given the right for their own reproductive rights. The whole notion that... that, that Women have to bear children, whether it is their calling or not, because patriarchy requires that they not have dominion over their own bodies, um, on one hand, and forests who, who, that are just cut down um, and affected by both, when we are so intimately as human beings and trees together, that the trees make the oxygen for us to breathe. And we, in turn, breathe out our carbon dioxide, which the tree takes in and makes into the the wood and the the substance of them. So we have actually, uh, in in many ways, the the trees of the world are like an umbilical uh, connection with the human beings on this earth. That if the trees all disappeared, they wouldn't make the oxygen anymore. And we would have a lot of trouble surviving in fact, that's the direction that climate change is taking us. And, of course, climate change occurs when there are more, less and less green in the world and more and more cities and people and pollution. So we're all, we're all linked. And the more we realize that we're, we're part of oneness, which, which is not part of many religions, but it is part of an innate spirituality that human beings have. And human beings have always been spiritual in and, and have tried to, to, to contain it within what is religion. So when you go back into history and you see that, that human beings used to create art, for example, and used to have rituals and all the religions. I, I, I came back from Egypt in March just before the, the borders were, were closed. I came back on the 10th and on, of March and on the 13th of March, uh, travel from Egypt, from Europe, unless you were an American citizen, was shut, was banned. Mm-hmm. So in Egypt, you would see religions that went back 5,000 years, and you'd see that there were there were images of their divinities, like uh, a bird-headed god, a crocodile-headed god, uh, goddesses. Uh, we we have made divinity images in how we perceive them throughout the history of humankind because humans have had an innate in there's something about we come into the world with a soul and this is the whatever the soul is we we try to put it into a religious framework and forget that it is so evoked out in nature quite naturally mm-hmm. And soul links us with everything. Everything is alive. Soul responds to beauty. It's a mystical experience that moves us. When we are, uh, if, you know, this nature deficit disorder, if you can't take kids out to summer camp, for example, to look at, at, the, at the Milky Way under the stars, you miss a major, major experience of, of nature as a teacher of what is what is amazing, mystical, spiritual, that there is a oneness that, that actually exists throughout nature. The, our indigenous peoples in, of North America seem to know that. They talked about the great mystery, which they, a, uh, comes from the word mystic. And actually, you know, before it gets drummed out of us, we are innately mystical, we human beings. 
Mm-hmm. I love how you, you, you bring that out as, as a major point to really consider in today's day and age. We have the time now being home. We have the time now being more one-on-one. We have the time now to breathe differently. And as you mentioned, I can feel it. I can feel the, the, the calmness of the busyness of the world has eased up. It's as if the earth is breathing differently or sighed differently through this. And to me, that's absolutely mystical and magical to to go outside and to feel that calmness again that's been so missing from our, our airwaves. You know, we don't realize how we're impacted by that mass consciousness of airwaves that bombards us on a daily level and, and very sometimes subtle ways. It's not always obvious ways. So that to me is just such a beautiful connection to, to get back into nature, to remind folks to get back into nature, and to have that, that kind of experience. I, I like to remind my friends to, when they go out and breathe in the forest, to remember that when you breathe out, the tree is breathing in. So there is a a real relationship there and your book talks about that so beautifully about not only the the breath of the tree but the ways that the trees are interconnected the way the trees communicate with each other there's a real community out there that we have been we haven't really been taught about and to get back to the indigenous beliefs my understanding of other world medicines such as Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine, they started with nature. And our medical system here seems to be broken. There hasn't been a holistic well, component. The remedies, I mean, it, it's if you, if you realize that animals such as bears um, and others seem to eat certain herb-like foliage from time to time when some part of them is hurt or or Mm -hmm. inwardly upset by by something they ate or something there's there's something about uh what what people have learned and animals have learned um you know like the, the the kind of like catnip and things i mean there's things that there seem there seems to be an innate something uh a knowledge that we can tap into. Uh, I love the image of the, the tree. Image is a major human art form, and and it stands for so much. Uh, there's so much symbolism in a tree. When you see just the trunk and the arms of the tree and everything, you see uh, something that resembles like a standing human figure at one level. But then to realize that. What is above is below as well. That the root system and the branch system are very much the same under under most trees. They, that there's a, a an as as it was once said, uh, as above, so below. Uh, there is something about the tree as an image of a religious image. It's an image that Carl Jung used as at times as an image of the complexity of us as the bigger self that we what we are connected to the collective unconscious in much the way the roots go down into the earth that we in our psyches are collected symbolically to so much i mean if you start listening to dreams which is part of the work of a of a jungian analyst what sometimes is amazing is that people come up with symbols that they have not encountered in their own lives. Mm-hmm. It's they've tapped into some deeper human layer, which Jung called the collective unconscious, and Rupert Sheldrake, who studies a lot of species, called the morphic field for our species. But that every single species has its own morphic, morphic field, and what the species learns goes down into the equivalent of the root matrix and then becomes instinctual haven't we always you know after a long fight for example i i too be appreciated how how when real change happens it happens because there's been a struggle and it often against oppression and this is actually what's probably happening now and 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 it's women 
who have, uh, who I obviously am most connected with in the struggle for equality. And I, and I recall reading about and, and thinking about, um, how we got the vote and how I didn't appreciate it. I thought, I, I said, haven't we always gotten the vote? Well, no. Back in, in 1850, the struggle began and it didn't end until 1919 when it was finally part of the Constitution as the 19th Amendment. So, and then once it happened, once a critical mass of our species in the United States, human beings, decided it was women could have the right to vote after all, then haven't we always had the right to vote? My initial reaction is what is the reaction once there is change in the species? We behave differently now. Haven't we always behaved this way? No. It's when we grow through the changes that we make. And it's women who are currently pushing against the system we have, which tends towards exploitation of us and the planet. So anyway, that's why I start to bring my activism and my Jungian symbolic thinking and everything sort of together. Well, yes, and you do it so beautifully because uh, until I read your book, I hadn't thought of the deforestation of, of the trees in the forest in terms of oppression of women and the, the, the gross disregard for women and women's rights around the world, you know, and you bring that to the forefront uh, in there. You, you talk about, um, I love your example about the microloans in there and how there's a difference between a, a male potentially operates in the world versus the way a f female potentially operates in the world. And you give us examples on, on the differences. Um, would you mind sharing that with us? Well, it began with talking about the, the microloans. That they, they, they thought they'd start out fair, that they would... Uh, loan to men and to women, which was a major step to loan to women as well. But then what the banks found was that women paid them back and men did not as a whole because men spent their loans often on things that had to do with um, status. And, and women also had a way of working with each other when they got a loan and would spend the money on something that would create a, a micro industry and would support the family. And so finally the 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 the, the, the first bank that did major micro loans to people all over the poor poor people all over the world, what they did was require that the woman have like three or four other women who would be like her circle. She would get the loan based on what she would spend it on. They would be like her, her advisors. And when she paid it back, they in turn, then two more of them, could also get their micro loans. And so mm -hmm. I found it interesting. I, I use it more as a circle metaphor uh, mm -hmm. because of, the, of how we learn from each other in circle and support each other. And then studying sort of the anatomy of the difference between the male brain and the female brain and there's a there's some there's some really good research on the difference between the two types of brains and how women more naturally uh, are not only nurturing but collectively work together much more naturally than the the way the well where they're basically they're t they're two instincts that are different between male and female and and we have male and female aspects in everybody so it's not that separate because I but the, the male uh, part of the brain that has to do with fight or flight is much larger than the women's same part of the women's brain that also has flight or fight but it has a large section of the brain that has also been called tend and befriend which is not like a large part of a male brain so tend and befriend has to do with that quality of nurturing and a sense of, of, of connecting with others. And so the idea of, instead of hierarchical kinds of, of, of arrangements, that it's, would be more like 
the equal idea of circle and and the um, one of the one of the inspirations for circle in a sense for me since I walk among trees is watching and seeing how redwood trees have burls on their roots and when when re- when a redwood tree or the mother tree the one the first tree would say would be the mother tree mm-hmm. and then it sends its roots out and burls often grow on that and if that mother tree dies what happens is that the burls that reach out radiate out from the central tree then set up shoots and what you have mm-hmm. and i would see would be a circle of trees mm-hmm. the the daughter trees or the mother tree and there's something about those sacred circles and this is also a human kind of quality collect with um you know when you collect around a campfire uh everybody is equal in a circle warmth differently uh and and the idea that fa- a family could operate like a circle organizations can um this is this is the sense of of how not only why why I'm talking about in, the, in this time of a a pandemic where it's as if nature herself has stepped in to change the direction that we are going in we are go- we were going in the direction of of maybe two or more three more decades before climate change would be devastating well now it's quite different if we are out walking and if we are ho- sheltering at home and we need to walk out from time to time and not interact with other people what we're doing is we're going inward and we're relating to the nature around us it's an amazing sudden change in not only the actual atmosphere which is clearer the sky is bluer mm-hmm. but the atmosphere of us being able to find the still point in ourselves which is soul yes and it takes quieting the busyness to touch into that um you know god speaks to us in the stillness uh that's how the divine reaches us and it's interesting cuz the divine also my understanding is works in paradox so you you, you have to look at the the light in the dark and the quiet and the busy to see the paradox of how we had to stop the world in order to gain this so we can move forward hopefully in a healthier way you know deciding what's really important out there we need voices like yours and mine to to uh be strong and to remind everyone about these beautiful connections with nature and the answers are there i really believe nature has all the answers if we take the time to look at it but the our society's models have separated us from that and this is an opportunity for us to rethink the program to rethink how we want to be outside how can we create that in the day especially if the engine starts back up again well this time out uh, might be very profound for lots of people of uh, shifting shift we we are in a time which the word liminal applies liminal is a, a word that comes from the word threshold um and when you're in a liminal time you you it's it's like being on a threshold between two large rooms for example and and there's a doorway in between and the threshold is 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 what you have to cross over to move from one space to another space well once this pandemic hit and all of the changes occurred we stepped into an unknown liminal threshold because we don't know what we will step into after we get through this period nor do we know for sure how long this liminal period will last but everybody in this time is aware that they or someone they care about could die so this mm-hmm. is a sudden realization that one an elder a parent could die 
or a vulnerable person they love could die, or they could die, or they could be a carrier and responsible for bringing mm-hmm. some, the, the pandemic to somebody they care about. And suddenly there is, a, I mean, if, if you feel that, it, it, it stops you in your tracks to much as a cancer diagnosis does. I have seen how people change mm-hmm. and and transform at the thought of, I mean, we, we know we all die, but we don't get it until we get a diagnosis that says we could die of this. And then there's a sense of, well, what really matters? If, if possibly we are going to die, what really, really matters? And then... All kinds of soul growth happens. All kinds of communications with people you really care about begins to happen. You come up against your dream life that can be profoundly deep at the same time that it scares you to death because it's reminding you of your mortality. And to be reminded of both mortality and soul together is a enormous potential for a quality of soul or conscious raising could be going on now. Well, that that's an interesting uh, way to frame to way to frame it, because the soul is, from my understanding, is is not tied to this physical body. It is while we live, but the soul goes on, and uh, the soul is the is the director of our show, even though we think we are. So, if you're talking about facing our mortality. I think our society is basically afraid of it, and I worked in cancer nursing. I worked in geriatrics. Mm -hmm. I was witnesses to people Mm -hmm. crossing over, which was really a privilege and an honor to be there with them. So for me, I see the world a little bit differently, but that's not the case out there. You know, that's not the discussions out there. Folks are, uh, uh, get afraid of their mortality. And we, and I, I think our culture perpetuates that fear I don't well, know if, if you agree there. I, I think it varies a lot. Um, and, and, and I think that, that women, especially women who have born children and gone through labor and delivery and realize that the, the, the liminal time for a baby and the mother is when the baby is coming out of her. Mm-hmm. And it's going to go under the pubic bone through the birth canal into the world. And that's a liminal time. Before the baby was in the mother and, and was was carried in the womb or the uterus. And then there is the outer world. And it is the most dangerous time for the mother or the baby to survive as it goes through the birth passage or this liminal time into the world. And the sense of... of um, profound uh, vulnerability and yet being part of the miracle of life, I think is an innate part that can occur in some or many women mm-hmm. who, who have a sense of, of their giving birth to new life or carrying new life into the world. And having somehow the ability to do that may make women as a gender less afraid of the 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 life that we live that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then the question is, if you are mediumistic or psychic or pay attention to your dreams, you do have a sense that that death itself is not the end. And that is something that all the religions have made a, a point of making, but they've often put all kinds of conditions as to right. how it is that you could, you know, get through to the other side. And so what is um, happening with lots of people is having to think about these profound things. I agree. I agree. And as you mentioned before, it, it often takes a tragedy or something that scares us to push us to the threshold so that we can wonder about what's on the other side and what does that mean and maybe co-create some of that. We have that power. We have the power to create, co-create a better world. Uh, there's so much happening on a grassroots level. Your book, again, gives many uh, uh, 
situations from the tree huggers and the tree people and what they've been doing to promote the the importance of trees you have uh, the uh, hidden life of trees in Germany and what he's uh, the, the author has done with the forest out there uh, the simple act of taking away machines and putting in oxen has made a tremendous difference to the caretaking of the forest so I see a lot of innovation happening but I don't hear it easily available and that's the time that we're in well you know if people started to to have time to be in circle conversations and if one of the subjects that comes up would be to remember back to when you were a child and what kinds of rituals and what kinds of, of, of feelings did you have toward trees, towards nature, towards... I mean, there's something about remembering who we used to be that, that, and to learn from the child we were, as well as to have an innate wisdom in us. I mean, this is, we don't come into this world as a total blank slate. We come into the world as a soul who has to learn vulnerability from the very get-go, because we come in as, as vulnerable little babies. And we are treated well or treated badly. We suffer. You can't get through life without suffering. Mm -hmm. And along the way, what do we do with that? Does it make us more compassionate to others? Do we then deny our feelings and, and identify with aggressors and act just as badly as other people treated us? What do we do? I mean, this soul journey that is this, this human experience if people could really appreciate that they have been given what used to be called the magnus opus, the great work, that each of us has our own great work to do with what we came in with, with this one life. It may be just one chapter in an ongoing longer, longer story that we don't remember because we come into the world with no memory of the past if we had previous lives. And I think that, that there is an ongoing connection that we that is part of this this ability to tap into the collective unconscious in such a way that there's wisdom there. Mm -hmm. I think that if we all sat together in wisdom circles, for example, or or and 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 and, and considered if we invited up a wise person in us, what would the wise person say? If we invite up our that the child who ventured into new adventures and asked ourselves, well, what would that child have to say about this place in between? We will be reconnecting with, with parts of ourselves that we haven't time for. So this is a wonderful time to be connected with all kinds of parts of ourselves in our own history in this liminal time of having to be sheltered in place. Mm. That's beautiful. I, I could see families maybe taking up that clarion call and even doing something fun with the children, have them describe going from one room to the other and standing under the doorway. That could be a great family uh, family time. Uh, but also f to remind everyone to talk to their elders and their family so the stories aren't lost because the stories have a way of being the glue, the fabric of who we are, where we came from, what we're going, you know, what are, what are, what are, what is our work to, to do in the world? You know, there's nuggets in there. Um, it might not be the the actual story itself, but it could be the determination in the story. It could be the passion that's in the story that ignites a family member to take up the reins of their passion, and what is their determination. You know, that's how I see the family connections in the circles. We have, uh, time has gone by, zip, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has, it has, and there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I would love you to just perhaps leave us with some connections um, for your women's work, the I know you're involved with the UN. There's something coming up in 2022 in India that you're hopeful about. Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about that before we say goodbye. 
Well, I'm sensing a bad, you know, when I watch the coronavirus charts and it talks about geometrical or exponential growth, it starts out with our interconnection. That This is why it is spreading so speedily through the population and why sheltering in place so that we don't infect each other is so important. Mm -hmm. Because of the way a good idea can pass as fast as the coronavirus, and it's maybe not as fast, but in the same way, exponentially. Mm -hmm. When women get get together with men who are who who feel themselves as part of brother sister equals in at, at some soul level that we are are siblings, men and women, and when we learn to trust and speak from the heart, speak from the soul, and learn from one another, we deepen ourselves and. We, form, we create an energy, much as a tree creates an aura or an energy around it, we create energy within circles with us. And we reach down into the collective knowledge and wisdom of everybody in that circle. And we help the, each of us then, in, in being a circle, seeds other circles. And what happens, I believe, may be happening now because what I see now is that circles are forming online, for example. You mm -hmm. can remember, oh, I I can connect with my good friends from high school, from college, from some other point, or and then decide that well let's it's exciting to meet each other and have have conversations and then let's let's do this regularly uh for a while and and especially if you put some symbols, if you bring your symbols in and put it like even a basic symbol as a candle, <laughs> it's like the illumination at the center of a circle. And then what happens is that that the the idea of circle, each circle that forms adds energy to the collective unconscious, which makes it easier and easier for all over the world for circles to form. And, and this has been a principle that um, has been described quite a bit, actually. And and you don't see it until it reaches a tipping point that it has actually changed the culture. I mean, I use I use the women's right to vote as just a small example of something that the idea spreads and spreads, and then it becomes part of the innate culture. And then once it does, it's like taken for granted. Well, the idea of a, a culture in which the feminine and the masculine are balanced, that we are connected like the indigenous folks do, that we are connected to Gaia the Earth, and that we are part of a oneness that sustains not just us but our planet, because we treat each other and the planet as important because we are all interconnected. Once we get the sense of interconnectedness, we as a as humanity will make a major shift in consciousness that could be profound and touch into a major spiritual sense of oneness that underlies everything. Hmm. Well, that is so beautifully said, and it's 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 a hopefulness for the future too. Uh, you know, I do a lot of meeting people and interviewing folks such as Doug Tallamy who's a bug who's a bug guy and he has not so good statistics for us today but yet he said our hope lies in nature and and that's the name of his la latest book that just came out this year you know nature's best hope and again your work his work others are saying you know let's learn and observe nature better we have the time to do it and i think our answers uh, are there on so many levels and you've touched upon several of them today in this beautiful beautiful discussion thank you for inviting me to to bring these ideas forth because i you know i feel this is partly something that is mine to do and so it felt a bit like a synchronicity to be invited to speak to whomever it is that your podcast reach. Because this is how synchronicity works. That as long as you put out something 
into the world. The possibility that it will land like a seed, you know, like a dandelion. You blow dandelions out into and and they get they float away and they land. If they land in a fertile soil, it will grow. The the podcasts you do are like seeds that go out into the world, and somebody who is fertile ground, because whatever that particular podcast is about, is exactly what that person needed to stimulate something important in themselves. So this is what I see you doing with these podcasts, and how podcasts or books or ideas reach people at just the right time. And the gratitude I have uh, whenever that happens to me, or when I hear from somebody that an idea that I put forth in a book that went out decades ago, for example, and yet landed just at the right time to inspire something. Mm-hmm. This this is how things work, and this is why I say yes to a podcast because, oh. She, you, you wanted me to talk about like a tree. Well, I haven't done that for quite a while, hmm. and, and it's just perfect timing for this this liminal coronavirus um, lockdown or sheltering. I like the word sheltering much better than lockdown. Sheltering way. <laughs> I agree with you. I like it. I like it much better too, uh, because there's a sense of being cared for in that sheltering rather than locked down, which means isolation, separation. At least that's how I hear it. So thank you for that reminder. Um, yes, and synchronicities to me are so incredibly magical. You know, we forget how they ignite us in that spur of the moment when something connects. And I love your reminders there too. Uh, Well, Jean, I'm going to say thank you for joining us at The Holistic Nature of Us. And I can only say again that I feel very inspired by your book, by your body of work, uh, and as well as our discussion today. This is Judith Dreyer. I am the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, and more. I'd like to remind all of you that a transcript is available for each podcast. Please like and share them. Let's support each other and get the word out. And remember, now is the time for practical action and profound interchange so we value our world again. Enjoy your day.